over the last, you know, period of time, we have seen really urbanisation, mining booms, uh, just driving uh, the price of real estate up as we've had structural changes through this real estate economy. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, we're going to dig into the housing affordability crisis here in Australia. We're going to have a conversation. What can we do to improve the chances for everybody to get into housing here in Australia? Or should it actually just be what it is? a capitalist country where those with capital can deploy it and, of course, yield the rewards from their risk. Are we living in a society today whereby it's just too extreme for everyone to be a property owner? Or can we tackle the affordability crisis which is here in Australia. How did we get to this place? These are all big questions. I thought I would give you my thoughts on how to improve the ability for people to get into the market, what government should focus on. Uh, I don't want to be accused of just complaining. I don't want to be a whinger. I want to try and add value. Every meeting I have, I try and add value to the world and make the world a better place. Through this podcast, I want to add value. Can I fix Australia's housing crisis? Maybe that should be the name of the show. Can the urban property investor fix Australia's affordability crisis when it comes to property? Well, let's see if I can. There's certainly many reports that have been put together by government to try and come up with solutions. And of course, uh, this creates a lot of debate. And uh, for the most part, a lot of nonsense is put together, which uh, never becomes uh, or never sees the, uh, you know, the light of day. Hey, thanks for tuning in, Urban Property Investors. Uh, I appreciate your support. So, uh, yeah, good for you. Thank you for coming to this show. And of course, for new uh, listeners, thank you as well for coming to the show. Now, we have a rule. Play the show in double speed. Get your life back. You don't want to listen to me waffle on. Sometimes I listen to my podcast and I'm like, wow, that is just way too much waffle. So I'm known to be a waffler. And uh, I don't want you to listen to my waffle. I want you to take away some tips and really just learn from from what's possible in real estate. Obviously, most of my shows are about replacing your income. And I think obviously that is a big part of the puzzle. Most Australians need to work out how to retire on income, whether it's a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars a week. Uh, it's our job living in a capitalist country to deploy capital and use assets which produce income to replace our own job at some point. We've got to lessen the burden on the system. But the system itself is under fire, and of course the Australian housing crisis is a big one. Uh, Australia, Australian real estate is really where most of the wealth in Australia is trapped and uh, it makes up a huge proportion. The Australian real estate market is one of the largest markets in the world. It's crazy to think it is, but it is. It is in a massive, massive economy. It dwarfs the Australian share market. It is really a huge trillion dollar marketplace. And as such, makes a huge, huge, huge percentage of Australia's wealth. But because a lot of Australians' wealth is connected to property, and we've seen real estate go from costing a can of Coke in the 1960s to today, a suburban middle-class home owned by a middle-class 
human being is in the multi-millions, well, of course, uh, you have to ask the question, how did we get here and how can we help more people get into the market in what is seemingly a never-ending price uh, point problem for people inside society. Today, uh, you really have to examine what it costs to own property. And for a lot of Australians, their income profile just can't afford what is even on offer when it comes to the property market. We can typically borrow five, six, sometimes seven times our uh, earnings when it comes to just getting into property. That's not being a property investor, that's being a homeowner. So if we, uh, as a household structure, maybe earn $200,000, we can go and five times that, borrow a million and buy a house. But uh, really, uh, you know, when it comes to, to the average price in our cities, they trade at different multiples. Sydney is something like it costs 13 times your earnings to, on average, to buy a property in Sydney. Uh, in Melbourne, it's around 11 times earnings. In Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, it's around seven to eight times earnings. So we either have to earn more money or we need to work out how to create more affordable properties so that society has a place to live. Otherwise, we are going to end up in a country where most people are renters. And I do think a big future is that, that most people will actually end up being renters in Australian uh, society. Australia really doesn't have a middle class anymore. And as such, we probably will see more people choose to rent for life. And that's just going to be a new normal. It's like that in uh, certainly Europe. Most people don't even think about property like it's some sort of way to get rich. They don't think about property as a form of home ownership. They think about property as a roof over their head. And, uh, you know, they pretty much just, you know, focus on it on it as tenants more so than being um, homeowners. So, you know, in my early twenties, I spent time in living in England. You know, typically people were were renting; they weren't um, trying to be homeowners in downtown London. It wasn't the way of the world. Uh, certainly 20 years ago. I know obviously people do own housing inside the United Kingdom and there's all sorts of price differentials. But I think, you know, most Australians um, have this kind of, I guess, hope that they can live in a better suburb, help their kids be raised in a better neighbourhood, they can move up in the world and really, uh, you know, the Australian mindset, if you like, is is to always be, uh, you know, trying to achieve uh, bigger and better things. And of course, over the last sort of many decades, Australia has been blessed. You know, we, we earn more than we probably should. Uh, we are blessed because we have a large, large, land mass which is full of dirt with minerals in it gold lithium iron ore you name it we have it uh and of course china which is our largest trading partner has gone through years and years and years of fast tracking basically uh its its cities to become you know modern full of infrastructure and really, uh, you know, uh, going from in the 1960s, you know, whereby people living inside of China, you know, were, um, you know, pretty simple rural, you know, human beings to today urbanizing that whole country. The steel to... Uh, change that urban landscape has all come from iron ore in Australia and coke and coal in Australia. 
So we have been blessed to build our wealth off really a second world country uh, coming and emerging into the modern world and and really uh, Australia's uh, focus, if you like, has been to sell gas, iron ore, coal and of course Australia has built a bit of a Ponzi scheme when it comes to the idea that new migrants increase the ability to create taxes, new migrants, um, if you like, uh, increase economic output. If you increase the size of your population, you can avoid technical recessions. And here in Australia, really, we have a services economy whereby uh, the business model is bring more migrants here and sell them something, sell them the dream. And they soon arrive and soon realize that Australia is an expensive country. Um, the cost of living pressures are high and uh, what you can earn is strong, but also equally if you are going to win at the game of of life here in Australia, if you are going to live in a capitalist country like Australia, you've got to play the game of capitalism. And in some respects, I think migrants are some of the best investors in real estate. They get it. They know that, uh, you know, typically coming from a country perhaps which is less fortunate than Australia, they know when they come here, they're blessed and they should do something beyond just earning money um, from their wage. But really, that's that's the 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 I guess economics of Australia. And uh, it's amazing to understand that that little section of economics has led to property values in simple middle class societies now worth millions of dollars. And if you think about it over the last you know period of time, we have seen really urbanization, mining booms, uh, just driving uh, the price of real estate up as we've had structural changes through this real estate economy. And of course, uh, really the idea of a Ponzi scheme is the greater full theory that someone comes along and just pays more for something that's actually overpriced to begin with. And a lot of the Australian property market is a greater full marketplace. There are so many places I would not invest in real estate in Australia. And really, uh, the greater full theory, if you like, also is linked to Australian monetary policy around property. Really, uh, as money changes value, assets like real estate have deflated over periods of time and inflated over periods of time. And certainly, um, we've always had the approach here of in Australia is get people into housing and try and inflate its value. That will create the wealth effect and uh, will bring more migrants into the country. They'll pay more. Uh, for the property and eventually um, we'll just create more and more wealth, more and more equity in housing. So we feel wealthier and uh, on paper we are wealthy, certainly by other country standards. But for a lot of Australians now, they own assets but don't feel wealthy or they are sidelined from ever getting into Australian property because they can't save their way to arrange enough capital to get into the Australian property market. And of course, uh, you know, a lot of Australia is now sidelined. You know, there's a concept that is known as the 30-40 rule. Uh, basically, the bottom 40% of incomes spend around 30% or more of their income on housing, uh, a roof over their head, whether it's through uh, owning that property or whether it's through renting that property. And that's just basically 
a huge, a huge amount of their income being allocated into property, which of course sideslides them from perhaps saving. It sidelines them from, um, you know, uh, enjoying, um, you know, other things inside of life. So certainly, um, you know, the 30-40 rule is something that I teach my investors, I think really uh, in some respects, you know, be very wary of the bottom 40% of the marketplace where those assets are. Um, you know, it's hard to put the rent up on people at that end of the marketplace. And of course, you know, the neighborhood effect is something I also teach whereby can really uh, the bottom 40% of the market, if you like, society renovate their homes? Can they draw down on more equity? Can they play this Australian property market model, which is fueled by uh, borrowings? And of course, um, you know, there's been lots and lots of people try and create a reform around Australian property. And we've even had elections over Australian real estate, uh, most notably the the uh, Bill Shorten, um, SCOMO election, federal election, um, and Bill Shorten got sent packing because he was going to basically get rid of uh, tax incentives for real estate and he was going to also meddle with um, basically taxing inside of Australian companies when it came to the share market. And of course, it's fair to say Australian companies, your West Farmers, your BHPs, need uh, basically the fractional taxing scheme to be competitive at a global level. Like really that fractional um, tax structure inside of the share market really does allow for Australian investors to invest in Australian companies. Without it, you know, most investors would go offshore. They would be buying shares in Amazon, Apple. Uh, but because of the tax deductions inside of the Australian share market through obviously um, fractional, um, you know, uh, the, the basically companies, um, you know, creating a fr franking credit for your uh, dividends – then, um, you know, you're, you, you've got a great asset class. But it's kind of uh, also that protection mechanism of franking credits that, you know, means that Australians invest in Australian companies. And, of course, we need Australian companies to be invested in because of, um, you know, like a global marketplace a marketplace whereby there are alternatives to invest in and we need Australian companies to be strong to build a bigger and better Australia. So those franking credits, I think I said fractional credits, franking credits um, are important to the share market as is gearing to the property market. Now, again, if you want to build a country of 40 million people and you want migrants to come here and the government can't provide properties, then someone has to. And at the moment, that someone's been you and me property investors. Um, certainly things are starting to branch out and the federal government through their most recent, um, I guess, budget has come up with some ideas to you know, help the, uh, the the system, if you like. And, uh, you know, let's go over a few of them. I think um, obviously the first one is the federal government has allocated $2.7 billion for rental assistance. So that 30-40 rule where 40% of the population is spending 30% of the income on living somewhere um, – you know, people can't afford it. So the government now is propping up the bottom end of the market to keep up with the top end of the marketplace, which uh, is a Band-Aid solution. It it obviously gets people through a tricky period for the next five years, but 
Band-Aid solution. It's not going to, uh, you know, change the value of properties. And in some respects, like as a capitalist, I don't know if I want properties to become cheaper for society. Like, should I just be a capitalist and go, well, you know what? My job is to deploy capital. And if properties become um, insanely expensive, so be it. Not my problem. But on the other side of the fence, you know, I think obviously, um, you know, making sure someone has a home, a roof over their head, um, you know, Australia's a nice place. Like we don't feel like we live in a dangerous cities. There's there's not a lot of, um, you know, overall crime. And there's not a lot of homelessness. Like, um, you know, compared to, you know, America, go to San Francisco. People today live in tents on streets in America. People today live in tents under bridges all over America. People today living under piers on beaches in tents because this became a real, real issue inside of certainly uh, the United States. So uh, the other, I guess, federal government you know, initiative, if you like, is they want to build over 1 million new homes um, to support, obviously, migration. Now, again, there's not that much evidence that they can go out and build 1 million more homes. I don't know how they're going to do it. This one really does feel like a bit of political, uh, you know, mastery, if you like. It sounds good, but, you know, Australia for the last 20 years has produced the same amount of properties it produced year on year 20 years ago. Things have not improved. We have not learned as a nation to accelerate property supply. We have not worked out how to do it. And uh, though politically it's a nice statement to say we would love to build another 1 million more dwellings, in theory that 1 million more dwellings is just the normal amount being supplied to the marketplace over, uh, you know, the period that was suggested to to happen. There is no way to add another 1 million surplus. There's just not enough builders around to supply it, right? We just don't have the amount of building companies around to produce the homes to actually create a more affordable product being housing. Uh, anyone who understands the real estate market right now would understand just how many builders have gone into receivership over the last 24 months. Something like 2,000 builders have gone under um, trying to supply the Australian residential real estate market. Now, think about that. That's, that's bananas, right? Like the fact that um, we now can't actually supply the marketplace because of costs, margins. Um, you know, we we find ourselves in a real problem. And in some respects, you know, there's one more boom that could probably arise if monetary policy changes. If rates rent down next week, real estate would probably skyrocket in value another 10 or 20%. That's how volatile the capital growth rate will be because there's just not the amount of stock. If we saw rates drop by 1%, geez, it would be game on. And again, like this is something that would just stretch most people to never be uh, never be able to to uh, get into the home ownership space, particularly via th- rule 3040. Rule 3040, 40% of society can, they're already spending too much on housing. How are they going to keep up if there's more capital growth? That's kind of the argument. Uh, I guess there has been some other, um, you know, ways to to increase the level of 
perhaps supply into the Australian property market other than the pledge to build 1 million homes. Um, and that is basically to reduce from 30 to 15% the withholding tax for funds, so um, property funds, REITs, uh, to go out and provide build to rent. So they um, can, you know, they're playing with the tax system to help the big end of town basically supply rental dwellings to the uh, 30, 40 section of the market. Basically, go and build homes for uh, people who can't afford to to keep up with the cost of living. And, uh, you know, the other, I guess, milestone in the build to rent space, if you like, is the depreciation allowance has gone up from 25 to 4%. So that means you can write off a building much faster and at a higher rate. And of course, this is to prop up, again, the build-to-rent world. And if you're not familiar with build-to-rent, obviously, just break it down into a couple of quadrants. First quadrant is normal supply to the rental market is provided by mum and dad investors, you and me, building a property portfolio. We want to retire on $2,000 a week. Uh, when we stop working, we need two or three properties to do that. Um, we need capital to deploy into the market. We play this game. However, uh, there is a small percentage of property investors that exist. Most people don't want to be property investors. Most people are just happy renting or owning our own home, let alone taking on more risk being a property investor. So uh, the government realizes that, that the day of mum and dad becoming a homeowner and property investor and then a multiple property investor and then a property investor that's in the 1% club, which is people that own multiple, multiple properties is over. Like most people can't uh, fathom that that is even possible and it takes real investor grit to get there and hence why, you know, quite often, uh, you know, podcasts, uh, my podcast, you know, like we try and help people become into that 1% of, of, of people in society, of, of property investors, like that own a lot of properties. Uh, it's very, very difficult. No one achieves it. Not many people achieve it. Like 1% of property investors achieve it, which is amazing, right? So uh, no one out there in the real world outside of the property investor industry, which is really small, is providing properties to the rental market. And so the government realizes this. So they now uh, approve properties for build to sell and build to rent. And so the build to sell market is obviously new construction that gets sold to uh, whoever. And the build to rent market is real estate, which is kept by basically uh, funds and REITs, real estate investment trusts, to rent uh, and there's a covenant put on the property for it to be held for like 50 years and the depreciation rate is increased. So basically it props up the reason why you would hold that investment as a real estate investment trust and, uh, you know, provide dwellings to the real estate uh, rental market, to the 30, 40, end of town, uh, which uh, which is, is, I think, you know, it's very popular overseas and, um, you know, we'll soon see what it, what, it, what it looks like here in Australia. It's early days yet, um, but what it will also do is put less supply into the build to sell market. So, you know, if half of the supply is going to build to rent, half of it's going to build to sell, that means... Typically, um, the properties which are built for sale, uh, there's less of them. And, uh, you know, if they're any good, they'll probably go up in value because of their character and uniqueness. Uh, other ways to help basically the Australian affordability crisis, according to the federal government, is to increase the national housing finance uh, capability 
Um, and what that means is provide better community housing. So more social housing, basically by government. Uh, they want to increase the cap um, that they're spending on basically social housing. So not only do private enterprise um, create build to rent, then the government creates social housing. So their own investments, basically, which they want to help uh, those in Rule 3040, which, uh, again, is um, a real thing happening. And uh, will it make more affordable properties? It may help. Uh, it may help. I don't know, but it may help. Uh, obviously, the government is also very, very keen on helping new Australians through first homeowner grants. And, uh, you know, this one's been around forever and a day. And now, of course, um, Australians can, you know, team up. Uh, two borrowers, they don't need to be married. Uh, they could be friends, family. They can get together and um, they can, you know, use some of those eligibility grants inside of first homeowner um, situation. Again, it tends to prop up, uh, if anything, the uh, bottom end of the market when it comes to new construction. It keeps a lot of people in work. It keeps the wheels turning around. It greases the wheels of big business that, uh, you know, own large parcels of land around the place. Again, it, uh, it you know, keeps things moving in particular because of how Australian Real estate is so tied to monetary policy of lending, which we'll talk about. Obviously, uh, the government also wants to invest in livability, which is an interesting thing. They really want to spend um, some money on improving economic infrastructure in urban precincts. So they do realise that Jobs need to be decentralised into all sorts of areas around cities. Otherwise, no one can move around. And of course, um, you know, if people live too far away from their workplace, real estate closer to workplaces becomes more expensive because people don't like ultimately commuting and wasting their life doing nothing. And so... Really, that's that's where we're at when it comes to reforms. That's it. That's what we got. Uh, that's the latest. So will that work? Will it create more affordable properties? Probably not um, is the answer. And again, uh, one of the challenges for Australia is we're an island and uh, we don't have access to cheap labor um we don't have access to you know um migrant workers that are kind of you know living in some sort of quasi proxy slave labor situation you know you go to uh the emiratis like you know they've got basically uh, you know, migrant workers that get paid nothing building these palatial cities. Um, and, you know, like that's the model. If you go to America, you've got a lot of people from South America coming from less fortunate economic backgrounds crossing the border into America and uh, ultimately providing less expensive labor inside America. It's, 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 it's a, America has a low cost labor system. Here in Australia, it's very difficult to get into Australia. It's a skilled based country. And so wages are going to be, by world standards, quite high. And of course, uh, this means building properties cheaper is difficult. Um, it just doesn't work like that. If you if you had a cheap labor source, you could build properties much cheaper and ultimately supply the real estate market at a much, much more, uh, you know, less expensive rate. So generally speaking, uh, when the 
conversation of Australian housing affordability comes up, you have different, I guess, swim lanes of discussion. You have the housing supply problem. We don't build enough properties. You have the demand side of the equation problem. Australia basically allows too much migration, which diminishes the economic pie for uh, the rest of people who are already in Australia. And when we talk about the economic pie of diminishing marginal returns from migration, what we're talking about is, uh, you know, um, you know, a million more migrants come here, where they're going to live. Well, that pushes up property prices. It pushes up rents. It pushes up time in the waiting room to see your doctor because now there's more people seeing the same amount of infrastructure or using the same amount of infrastructure. So these are the these are kind of the swim lanes. And uh, there's no right or wrong. These are just the swim lanes. So you get people basically going, well, we should build uh, a million more properties or 10 million more properties and then everyone can have a cheap property. The problem with that argument, I guess, is capitalism itself. Like if you were a developer and asked to supply the marketplace with properties, why would you supply it at a loss? It's never going to happen. So in my version of the world, the supply side of the equation is is one we can talk about but um you know other than getting perhaps the production rate up um you know a, a little bit higher than what it is you really real estate is driven by the demand side more so than the supply side and the demand side is uh will break down you know some of the conversations around fixing that maybe and of course the final swim lane that tends to be openly spoken about is taxes and property. Like a lot of people are like, you know, greedy capitalists getting tax advantages for uh, taking out personal guarantees, uh, risking their uh, entire wealth to go and borrow money off a bank to create a roof over a head for someone um connected to you know the 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 marketplace who who are renters for life uh you know again it's a little bit of an interesting one that one whereby it's popular to bag out tax reforms uh, as and paint certainly property investors as greedy capitalist pigs um and maybe i am a greediest capitalist pig but i I certainly feel like that what I do also adds value to the world. Like I like the fact that I help multiple families have a roof over their head and I am happily uh, invested in the real estate market knowing that I am getting tax deductions for taking on that risk. And would I choose other assets if that risk was taken away, potentially I would. And when you meddle with basically uh, taxing capital too much, you do run into a future problem. And again, like if capital is taxed inefficiently or overtaxed or not um, incentivized, then investors just find other ways to make money. And again, we've probably seen that with the crypto boom. Investors worked out a loophole in the system and went for it because it was quite efficient. Um, certainly, that side of the world has been cleaned up at the moment. But, um, you know, I think we have to have the conversation. So it's, a, it's a, really a three-part conversation housing supply, the demand side, and the tax side. It's really the three parts of the equation. And uh, I think for certainly we should rule out swim lane three, which is the tax. Um, if you want more affordable rents and you want more affordable properties in Australia, you've 
got to get rid of the tax conversation. Tax certainty and security is a very important mechanism to the demand side of mum and dad investors buying a property to put a tenant in it. It's a very important equation. And uh, again, like I think this, there is a bit of a false narrative portrayed in, you know, like that, you know, it unequally just pushes prices up to breaking point. It's already at breaking point. And again, if you withdraw more people from the system, it just gets worse and worse and worse. So again, like overtaxing or overregulating um, an industry just kills its viability. And again, it creates a monopoly, monopoly effect of a very small few can um, partake in the, in, in the process. And, you know, if we go back to how real estate actually commenced, you know, you, you had lords who owned everything and uh, basically the pleb class owning nothing. And again, like, you know, we're still lucky here in Australia that the lords, you know, the companies of the world, the REITs, you know, it's being socially engineered that they will own everything. And I think getting rid of mum and dad investor is a bad move because we can still supply properties to the rental market and put roofs over people's heads. But again, just get rid of this conversation that it's ever going to be a problem. Write it in stone that it's here to stay. And again, you'll probably have more people enter the property market as very conservative people with good wages able to invest in property. Um, and, you know, why would you take the risk if you were a mum and dad investor to enter the market if you weren't going to get a reward? So I think the first thing we need to fix to create a solution um, to providing more affordable properties is to just hit the tax one on its head because it's the most stupid one to talk about. Um, it certainly can even be improved and I'll talk about what that looks like. I think from the demand side, you know, people, consumers need to feel confident that they will get what they uh, are buying. And in some respects, I think the demand side, the consumer side, needs to think about property in a whole new way. Now, the way property is sold and worked on in Australia basically is we have real estate agents um, and we have consumers. And people come out of the schooling system with no financial literacy. I always say, you know, the Australian property market is kind of made up of over-educated, financially illiterate people. They've been educated on all sorts of things, but they are very financially uh, challenged when it comes to their number one biggest investment in their entire life, which is buying a property. And so I personally think that the buying a property concept should actually be a consumer license, like getting a driver's license. Like to go and drive a car and not, um, you know, run over 30 people, you need to do a test um, and you need to know road basics to move around the uh, the road network here in Australia. When it comes to buying a property, you don't need to know anything. And uh, you then go and you speak to someone in the property industry who usually left school in year nine and uh, 
you know, did a three-day course on buying a property and uh, now they're, they're basically a qualified agent and you either uh, buy off them or uh, even you use them to buy something, which um, again is abdicating responsibility. We as adults should be responsible. And so I really think, um, you know, when it comes to the idea of, of fixing the demand side of the equation, having a demand side of the equation which actually knows what, what, what they're in for is an important thing to me. Otherwise, it does come across like it's a bit of a Ponzi scheme. Like you grab some new migrants, you sell them your dream, um, you make them buy stuff, you get them a new house and away you go. So I personally think there's nothing wrong with capitalism, uh, you know, doing that. But I do think the consumer should actually do a license to make sure they know what they're in for. Because the real estate market is driven by human beings and human beings are volatile. And what irks me no end is volatile human beings getting into the real estate market. Just don't get into it. Become a real estate investor. But they don't know what they don't know and the school system doesn't teach them anything. So personally, I think to fix the housing crisis, a consumer housing license should be activated. And again, I think this would give consumers more confidence to perhaps buy a home, more confidence to become a property investor and buy a home that someone else rents. We need to educate consumers here in Australia. There is so many uh, well-appointed uh, uh people in well-appointed jobs with high incomes that don't provide housing to the Australian housing market. They don't. They don't take the risk. They don't want to know anything about it. They are invested elsewhere and they do not prop up being a landlord and play that game. And uh, I think they would if they knew that there was a level of certainty as to the type of people entering the market. So why not have a driver's license test for buying a property, a consumer housing license? Um, you know, I think it's an important thing. I think consumers should learn about location theory, market value, understanding home loans for one, um, returns, um, understanding market fluctuations, understanding, you know, how the Reserve Bank interfaces with society, understanding strata law, I think is very, very important. Like a lot of people don't even go to strata meetings. Like how did you buy a property if you won't actually participate? And I think this idea of, um, you know, making the actual consumer stronger is important because um, a strong consumer will ultimately feel more empowered to consume, but in a right way, not an irresponsible way. And so when I think about the demand side, I think people need to feel confident to shop. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like a you know, two-year course. It can, it can be just reading a book, um, knowing the basics, doing the test, doing it at the, you know, the local services. Uh, you know, here we have in Sydney services, New South Wales, you do it there, you pass the test, you're off. You've got your uh, license, if you like, to go to an open home, to go to an auction, to not go beyond your means when it comes to putting yourself in a financially unstable place. Because, um, I think a lot of the rhetoric around real estate is is around stability and instability. I think um, just having stronger consumers would really support the narrative that um, people know what they're doing. They're adults. 
get them moving. Get uh, get people if they can be invested. Get them get them doing it. If they can't be invested, they will learn. Um, perhaps you know the tenant world is the new world for for their for their place and space in this in this uh, landscape. I think as well, what's happened in New South Wales has been a good thing around the demand side of new properties being produced. So obviously, when we break down the demand side, there is established properties. What can we do to release their demand back into the market to create more affordability? Then you've got to go and build something brand new and bring it to market. And again, I think why a consumer could have a license is that they start to understand the pros and cons of 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 uh, new supply, existing supply, um, and you know home loans. Like like let's work out how to teach consumers this. Um, and I think also you know from the demand side, um, you know people need to feel confident if they are buying a new property that it is what they're signing up for. And here in New South Wales, you know, we we went through two decades of corruption when it came to construction. Um, buildings were a disaster. Like I haven't worked in Sydney's uh, new construction market for maybe 15 years. And the reason being was the building workmanship was just, so bad so bad like like it yeah like you just like every building was built with defects basically and so i think it was like two years ago or one year ago maybe relatively new no i think two years ago the new south wales to um government did something quite good they created a housing commissioner and um Basically, the housing commissioner, if you like, goes around and signs off on every building produced in in New South Wales and basically defects them before they get handed over to then be re-defected by an investor. Uh, And I think it's just amazing. Like, it's cleaned up the industry a lot for the first time in, I think, maybe two decades, I'm now starting to relook in New South, well, in, in Sydney in particular, for for real estate. Like, I steer cleared of it. Like, all that Opal Towers stuff you probably might remember if you look back. Because there was just, like, the consumers were not protected. And um, now they kind of are. And um, certainly... I've started to look at some things here in Sydney and gone, okay, the building standards have really, really, really improved. And um, again, I think if you want consumers to consume uh, on behalf of the tenant market to provide affordability, and I think we need to acknowledge that affordability is in two parts, affordable Great Australian Dream, buy your own home, and also affordability, uh, you know, 30, 40 rule, 40% of society won't be able to buy their own home um, and they need somewhere affordable to live if you want affordability. And again, I'm a property investor. It doesn't really matter to me because like at the end of the day, if none of this comes to fruition and homes are not affordable, I'm in the monopoly of people in society that owns multiple properties my rents go up and I get wealthier, right? So, you know, it, it is what it is. But again, if you want to try and solve the problem, I think really we've got to think about uh, the idea of the New South Wales Housing Commissioner being on every deal in Australia. Um, and then you've got this confidence level that you will get what you get. And really the problem was so bad in New South Wales, to be fair to other states and territories, they have been much better you know, better managed. But I think, um, you know, if you're a consumer, you did a license, you know that there's some proper um, rules and regs around handover, you're probably going to be more inclined to jump on um, supply, new supply. You're going to feel more confident about it. 
And I think that's that's one of the tricky things around supply is, um, you know, you've got to build all these properties, but someone ultimately has to buy them. And for a lot of people, um, you know, they don't feel confident in the new construction space. So, um, you know, fix that and you'll fix uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the amount of people who approach new construction. Um, I think from the demand side as well is housing growth in theory over the last 15 years has been fueled by monetary policy. Like properties have gone up because money has costed less. It hasn't been fueled, like capital growth hasn't been fueled by properties being rare and interesting and unique. And so we should buy that property. Um, I think the future is going to be more the latter, that scarce things will become more because money won't be ultimately, you know, very, very deflationary. Um, But certainly I think, you know, in the last 15 years, I guess, is housing growth, like the cost of housing has just inflated in value when money gets cheaper like people run like this kind of stampede so there's always people sort of pent up demand I guess you would say right now for example we're going to have a lot of pent up demand people just sitting on the fence not buying Um, there's no smoothness to the cycle it's either boom or trough boom or trough and right now we're in a trough and the next phase is is probably going to be robust growth. Uh, when that comes, I don't know. But all, all that occurs is this pent-up issue of uh, people not jumping into the market. And of course, we don't get this oversupply of stock because we need those people to jump into the market to produce more stock. So eventually we'll get this price spike and of course uh, a lot of this has to do with the way monetary policy works. Now, I don't know, you could smooth the system out by way of example of just doing a longer fixed rate period. Like in America they have 30 year fixed rate loans and really when inflation and things like that are spoken about, the housing market isn't so much the instrument to fix uh, you know, inflation. It's other things. Like it's government spending basically that has to fix inflation inside America and uh, it's taxes basically. So that, that, that they don't use their housing market to fix inflationary policy like we do because when you go to get a property over there, you get a 30-year fixed rate loan. You can refinance the property, you can refinance into a new fixed rate, but uh, pretty much the consumer isn't, and obviously the fixed rate changes based on the cost of money, but the consumer isn't, you know, feeling as volatile because they've signed up to something um, and, you know, you get this kind of more passive approach to the real estate market. It's not... um, you know, exploding because rates just went down, so everyone rushes in. It's it's not like that. It's a, it's a bit different. And so I think here in Australia, there could be an argument for just smoothing out the rate cycle so it sort of devalues monetary policy in a way that, like, again, if interest rates went down, if the Reserve Bank, Golden Gopnik, Philip Lowe, basically came out next week and said, hey, putting the rates down 1%. What do you think is going to happen to the real estate market? It's going to go up 20%. And again, what is real estate market going up 20% going to do? It's going to create an affordability problem. And so uh, I just think, you know, if you want to actually address the issue, maybe it's the way money is actually dealt out, which um, could you know, be improved, I guess you would say. And again, from a property investor's point of view, some of these things are just like terrible. Like uh, like that conversation, for example, of smoothing out monetary policy, you know, it could affect capital growth. But the way it works at the moment, 
you're going to absolutely get capital growth because what I just said will never happen here in Australia. Um, and what's going to happen is eventually rates will go down and all the pent up demand will pop out of the woodwork and we'll have a 20% growth year. That's what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to definitely happen because every time there's a trough, people park themselves, hide under the rock, and then they come out to play and they all do it at once. And this pushes prices exponentially. So you could smooth out money. Uh, that could be a, a way to fix the problem. Um, certainly decentralizing uh, CBDs is is one way to approach the challenge of affordability. It has been decentralized in, a, say, a place like Canberra. Canberra, you've got kind of five CBDs. You've got Woden, Tugranong, Canberra Central, Belconnen, and Gungalan. Um, but it hasn't certainly solved the cost of properties in Canberra. Um, so decentralizing CBDs, you know, i.e. having your hospital district, anyone who works in hospital lives in that section, having uh, your airport walkers over in one section, having your city workers in another section. Obviously, the concept is, you know, creating a more affordable kind of zone, if you like. Um, you know, it, it could work. Um, it may affect how demand thinks about real estate. I don't, don't need to live close to the city. I need to live close to another central um, business workplace but it's connected to hospitals or i need in canberra it exists um and i haven't seen that solve the riddle of affordability i mean canberra is so expensive like every every house in canberra is basically a million dollars um you know middle class lower middle class housing is a million dollars in canberra so um hey i think from a zoning point of view, like we could think about re-zoning uh, places which are already full of supply. Like it's wasted, it's wasted space. Now, there's always this conversation in Australia around, yes, in my backyard people and no in my backyard people, NIMBYs and the YIMBYs. If you ever want to see a good example of Yimbies and Nimbies, um, you know, there's a classic place to see it. And that is you stand in Balimba on the river in Brisbane. And Balimba is basically, you know, the highest story there is like two or three stories. Nimbies, they never build above the tree line in their neighborhood. Um, very low rise, very protected. You look across the river and you will see uh, over in uh, basically Tenerife, in Newstead, you will see Yimbies, yes, in my backyard. And um, there's no right or wrong. It's just the Yimbies prefer all the shops, all the cool like bars, gyms, all that kind of stuff. They like density done well. And the Nimbies don't like any density. And uh, in some respects, uh, rich people like being rich and so they don't like supply coming to their neighbourhood. That's how it works. They have meetings about not supplying their neighbourhood. Um, some Yimby neighbourhoods are very, very good. Like you make a lot of money in some Yimby neighbourhoods. You can make a lot of money in some NIMBY neighbourhoods. But again, there are some real wasted neighbourhoods that I think just should be teared down and started again and uh with you know height limits to the to the moon um i think we need to recognize that australia has a nice landscape and certainly the nimby places like just leave them the way they are move on from the conversation you're never going to put a skyscraper in uh you know downtown uh you know, uh, Mossman, you're never going to put a skyscraper in, you know, downtown Hampton in Melbourne. It's never going to happen. You're not going to have skyscrapers on Brighton Beach, Melbourne. 
Never going to happen. So let's just all move on. Dumb conversation. Why do we talk about it? I don't know, but let's all move on. So I'm from the Northern Beaches in Sydney. Um, Manly is a very significant place. It's, um, you know, it's important for Australia. We use it as a tourism draw card. It's a national significant area. So I think you just break it down, right? You got national significant areas. You leave them alone. Uh, Bondi Beach, Manly Beach, they're significant to the way Australia appeals to the world. To It's appealing for migrants to come here to know Manly Beach exists. Uh, you got NIMBY places, which are very character. Just don't worry about them. Leave them alone. They, they're never going to um, bend the rules to, to change. And then you've got YIMBY areas, which are perfectly good and have done great things to make urban those urban areas, great places. But then you've got these kind of like no man's places which are full of old derelict apartment complexes which add no value to the public realm. Now I'm from the Northern Beaches. Um, I mean, this will be hard to visualise if you're not from the Northern Beaches. But you could say, for example, Manly's a national significant cluster. You won't, um, you know, zone that. But you go to DY, I mean, DY is one of the greatest places in the Northern Beaches to live in an apartment. It's fun. There's stuff happening everywhere in DY. I really, I really dig it. But it's full of red brick, um, you know, eyesore apartment complexes which are falling down, which are three stories high. Um, why shouldn't they all be knocked down and government basically – um, goes through some sort of reacquisition of those lands and basically joint ventures with the REIT and builds, you know, uh, 40-storey buildings. Why not? Uh, it's an accepted apartment zone. It's YIMBY done right, whereas DY is, is basically YIMBY done wrong. And I think we need to fix our YIMBY done wrong areas and reinvent them. And uh, you wouldn't need to worry about the NIMBYs, nor these beautiful, significant character areas at all. Why? Because this stuff always already exists. The height limits are wrong, and you would be able to supply the real estate market um, in areas which are used to that typology of product. DY is very used to apartment living. No one lives in DY and goes, oh, you know, there's too many apartments. Like, they know what it's like and it, it's designed for apartment livers like it's really really cool like you go down there it's kids playing in the local parks with other kids and they all live in apartments it's great it's done right but its level of height is done wrong yimby done wrong this is the conversation that should be had all right the other conversation i think we need to have is around value yes value now, this is the long podcast. I didn't realize this podcast was going so long. Um, you need to speed me up. Play me in double speed. If you're listening on single speed right now, you probably, you know, uh, want to shoot yourself. Um, so don't shoot yourself. Speed me up. Simple. Double speed. Valuation needs to change here in Australia. If you want basically more density, more supply, more people um, in more affordable products, then you can't build 300 square meter homes um, that everyone wants to live in. You need to rethink spatially how space is valued. And again, valuation metrics need to be rethought. Um, so what we value in society and what is valued to a bank and what is valued to a a buyer's agent and what is value to a real estate agent, it's all distorted. Now, if you think about it, right, if it's actually more valuable for society to function together harmonious, if that's the goal, if the goal is truly we want Australians to live in a completely middle-class society um, whereby socially we're we're just simplifying what things cost to live. If that's the goal, 
then value needs to change. It's as simple as that. So if it's more valuable, for example, for society to have people live in a four-bedroom home on 100 square metres of land, that's more value to society uh, than it is for society for people to live on 500 square metres of land in a four-bedroom house. Then we need to make that more... uh, appetizing and actually stand behind it if that's what we want that's what we've got to go and do and again you can't have all these rules and then everyone wants to live um, in the best suburbs the best streets in a 600 square meter home in a nine bedroom mansion it's just it's 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 a silly conversation so it's if it's actually more valuable for society to live in a different space then we have to make buying that more valuable. That can be no stamp duty for the 100 square metre home. That can be a monetary policy that makes the 100 square metre home better value than the 600 square metre home. Cheaper home loans. You could have today green loans, so you get actually a half a percent discount off the bank rate when you get a green star loan, when you own a property with a seven star thermal efficiency rating, why not have a space loan, a space efficiency rating loan? Yes, Uh, that could be a thing. And again, like we truly serious about this, like you got to get serious because again, like if you want more people to buy an affordable product then you're talking about 100 square meters of land you're talking about a compact house and you're talking you know four five hundred thousand dollars and you're talking um basically rewarding the consumer who's got the license to go and buy that product how are you going to reward them You're going to lend the money cheaper. Um, You're going to give them a discount, maybe because that's new construction. You're going to give them a green loan. And now you're going to give them a space loan, an efficiency loan, a space efficiency loan. All of a sudden, they're borrowing money for 1% less than everyone else. Uh, All of a sudden, that product type becomes a very in vogue thing. It's more affordable. If you want affordability metrics, you need to match the concept. Oh, I want to live in an affordable, um, uh, in an affordable manner. Here's an affordable dwelling at an affordable uh, interest rate. That's the model. And again, it's not um, to fix the uh, solution of making money out of real estate as an investor. It's a completely different conversation. Uh, if Society wants to socially engineer people living in smaller properties with less debt, with cheaper money, it can be done. Um, and, uh, you know, you just you just can't reward buying a 500 square meter block of land. You just can't. Um, you know, in theory, what is better for society? That's the conversation. Maybe it's like, oh, you're buying in a NIMBY area. Your interest rate is X. You're buying in a YIMBY area. Your interest rate is Y. All of a sudden, you're socially engineering the outcome you're looking for. And of course, um, I think when it comes to creating affordability, obviously, there's a lot of established properties that sit around. um, And if there's way more established properties than there are new properties that are produced. And so a lot of established properties, again, need to be bulldozed and redone. Um, And I think as well, you've got a huge amount of landlords that, for example, would migrate their money to another marketplace um, if they could get a waiver on capital gains tax 
So by way of example, let's say you had a property, you've got $200,000 in capital gains tax by selling the property that you would incur. You don't sell because you have a lock. Like you don't want to pay the tax. It's ridiculous. So you would be like, I'm not selling that property. It's in a good spot. I bought it, you know, two cycles ago. I've got a $500,000 capital uh, tax on the property if I sell. Uh, It's in one of the best, um, you know, little areas close to the city. It's a little, you know, investment property, but it's got a lot of gain to it. I'm not selling the property. So guess what? You don't sell and it doesn't release the supply back to the marketplace because you have capital gains tax locks. Now, I've got this. I've got capital gains tax locks. I've got great properties that I would happily sell if I wasn't being gained. Now, I think there could be a a simple legislation around this. If you sell and rebuy within 12 months as an investor, uh, in other words, you don't disadvantage the rental market by removing your property, you sell and rebuy in the same financial year, let's say, Uh, you migrate your money. So let's say I've got a property in downtown Sydney, love to sell it. You know how many people would want to live in downtown Sydney? Six Ks from the city? Mate, most people, most people, happy to sell it, happy to put it back on the market. Uh, Equally, I'm happy to go and buy another rental property somewhere else. Um, Happy to do it, just don't charge me capital gains tax. And I will provide another rental property and I will provide someone a home to go and live in. So there it is. No capital gains tax if you redistribute the money two for one. You're going to get two for one. So I'm no genius, but I think that in itself would be one of the best ways to free up supply of existing properties in infrastructure rich areas now not everyone would do it because a lot of people like owning their properties in infrastructure rich areas but some people like me who play the game of real estate where we like to move our money around maybe have better opportunities whereby if it was tax effective we would Go and chase those better opportunities. I'll say it right now. Don't charge me the capital gain on the property I have, six Ks from Sydney CBD. I will use that money and go and buy another property and put a renter in it and I'll free up that property for a first homeowner or whoever it is to go and live in affordability. I've just created affordability. Uh, Eventually, the government will get its tax, its capital gains tax on the next property. Or I, again, shuffle the board and provide an established property back to the property market. I'm just giving solutions. Maybe someone who has higher authority than I is listening to this and will do good. And I think uh, when it comes to... The final thing I would suggest is, again, density done right is awesome when it's done well. Here in Australia, obviously, we have a fascination of of wanting to live the you know the great Australian dream in a in a nice house with a white picket fence. I get it, but the reality and the cost are two different things. Australians need to learn to live in apartments. And um, of course, if you've ever been through Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian or Asian countries, if you like, have, have long since learned how to live in apartments. They do it very, very well. Australians, not so well. Like we don't know how to do it. And, um, you know, whether it's a nice family-friendly apartment or a luxury apartment or like we, we, like, we just don't know how to do it at scale. And so this is why with apartments, 
it's quite often very selective what you buy as an investor because, um, you know, it's got to be in the right street, right suburb, right floor plan, all that kind of thing to, to tick a lot of boxes. And so personally, um, you know, I know how to seek out a really good apartment, know how to do it. I've been in real estate 30 years. I know how to do it. Most people don't know how to do it. Um, and again, like probably goes back to the consumer license conversation. This is what, you know, ticks the boxes. But also equally, I think government has a role to play with people living in apartments. I do. Uh, density done right is much more fun than going and living in the outskirts of a city um, in a house with no infrastructure. It, it is. And I've seen it done right in many, many places and I've seen it done wrong in many, many places. And again, like obviously when a new property is produced, the uh, developer pays a contribution to the local council for the local council to basically connect public amenities to the new property produced. Um, you know, it can be called a section 94. For, um, now, I personally think that that money should be better managed and not just disappear into a black hole. So let's say you've got 20 people who are buying uh, density done well, a new property, a new apartment to live in. They want to be a family. They want to live in the apartment. Um, in the contribution through what they're purchasing, the developer just using loose maths is paying $100,000 to the local council per apartment per 20 people. So that's, what's that? Two, $2 million. So $2 million is going to local council to connect the uh, power from the street and uh, connect the uh, sewer. Probably doesn't cost $2 million to do that. So there's extra money. Where does it go? And I'm a big believer that people love living in apartments if there's good extra free space. In fact, when I put together real estate deals for people, I'm always looking, particularly with apartments, for the asset to free space ratio. People don't mind living in an apartment if down the street or across the road, there's a beautiful park that they can go and kick the footy and, uh, you know, go and walk the dog. They don't. However, most apartments are just urban concrete eyesores that are not near any form of green space. Hence why, from a property investor's perspective, um, when I look for it, for an investor, it's I'm usually, you know, putting together something that stands out from the crowd. But anyway, this conversation isn't about making money, is it? It's about creating affordability. You would have more people choose to live in that type of housing if one, that type of housing, again, came with a different valuation. Uh, it was valued more by society. And of course, it was perhaps got a smaller space home loan from the banks because it was valued differently. It's like, wow, you know, that's a much more affordable product. Go buy that one. Um, and you would get this kind of people who were like, absolutely, I would love to live closer to the city in a better uh, area with full of infrastructure. If I can get the space efficiency loan and pay a cheaper rate, I'd absolutely do it. However, I also want our contributions for buying this new property openly, open sourced, and I want to know where the money is spent. And I want to see it go to new parklands being built within a reasonable area 
to the property that I'm buying. And I think you would have so many people go, great, love it. I'm getting a park down the street. You know, one of the things I was always fascinated about in England when I lived there for a while was, um, you know, 150 years ago, they came up with the concept of private gardens. So you have all these sort of terrace houses around, um, beautiful terrace houses, uh, obviously all, weren't always beautiful, but certainly today they are. But, um, you know, beautiful little terrace houses scattered where people really had no backyard. And to compensate for the fact that there was no backyard, the uh, terrace houses were all connected to a private garden, which is under lock and key. It's basically for residents of the uh, the terrace homes. And, you know, it can be a 10-minute walk to the private garden. And what happens every day in London, little people live in these terrace houses and they walk to their private garden 10 minutes away under lock and key, which is not for everyone. It is connected to their home and they get to play in it. So I think Australia just needs to rethink how density is done. What is the barrier for, for example... Those contributions of money, um, let's say there's, I don't know, 100 apartments built, there's now $10 million. Go and rebuy two houses where there's 85-year-olds living in there that won't leave, reacquisition their land, buy their house off them for a pretty penny. Obviously, be nice about it, but just go and do it turn it into a beautiful little pocket park, which is then connected to, um, you know, perhaps five or six, you know, dense, um, medium density uh, apartment dwellings. Like actually open source the money. Where does the money go? Where do these contributions go? We want to see the money spent and we want it actually spent on advancing the public realm. I do believe there's a way to solve the affordability problem here in Australia. And I don't think it's with the current uh, way it is being handled. I've given you my thoughts on how to solve it. If you want to use a government, by all means, you won't use it. Uh, so property is just going to be worth more. So if you're a property investor, you know, what I talked about, um, you know, would um, certainly take a new pathway for property investment. And uh, this is why I think it's very important that real estate is not a product of monetary policy. Real estate is about scarcity. So the more interesting, the more high caliber, the more uh, better location your assets are, I think that's what real estate should be about. And I think in a marketplace where money is much higher, that's what it will be about. The next 10 years of real estate is about holding the golden egg of real estate, the best piece of real estate for your budget. All right, folks, that could be officially the longest podcast I've ever done. I think we've broken a new record. Uh, I didn't realize I would be talking for so long, but hey, take care. I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.